We're ready to start. Welcome everyone. On the program today we will complete the lecture on the theory part of demand response and the second half of these sessions today will be devoted to finishing the lab or to continuing the lab. And then we'll meet again on Friday for the end of the lab and also for a quiz. This is what we had quickly described last week. This is all the different aspects of demand response. And what we will focus on now is how demand response can be using tariff or prices to, to make some form of control. We will also discuss what is the correct answer to this question that we had polled last week. Uh, some demand response aggregator, like notably this one, but I'm sure many others do, they claim that demand response events, like shutting off your boiler, will decrease the total energy consumption. We'll see whether this is true and whether we should expect such a thing or not. So we'll go now through some elements of theory, or the classical theory that is used when forging a demand response mechanism, not just demand response mechanism, it's also the theory that underlies electricity markets. So it's based on a very, very simplified model of how consumers and producers operate. Um, so we assume that consumers implicitly or explicitly have a given curve which is called the utility curve. So utility curve says for a given quantity Q of energy that you buy during a time slot of, for example, five minutes or 15 minutes, what is the utility that you assign to it? Right. It's uh, because economists want to do mathematical theory of things, so they put math everywhere. And uh, perhaps the, the most classical view of this uh, utility function is something uh, of that kind of shape, which is here, concave. Concave means that if you give me some amount of energy, I am that happy. If you give me much, much more, I am a bit more happy. And a concave curve in this se setting here, when it's increasing, means that it has diminishing returns. That the, um, the derivative is decreasing. The derivative becomes smaller. So if I have already a large amount, if you give me a delta Q, the increase in utility is smaller. That's a general way of modeling a utility function. Usually, we assume a utility is concave. As opposed to a cost, I will say that is usually assumed to be convex. Now, not all curves are concave or, co or uh, convex. So th this is perhaps a utility that corresponds to very, very rigid behavior, non-elastic loads. I come home in the evening, I want to switch on some appliance, I need that amount of energy to, for this to work. If I don't have it, I am very unhappy, so the y-axis is not written here, but this would mean very, very unhappy. And if I have, uh, sorry, if I have it, I am very happy. And if I, have, I don't have it, I have zero utility. Having less than what I need gives me zero benefit. So that is the case, I would say, of traditional loads when we do not do demand response. And then when we do demand response, we expect to have something which is a mixture of the two. We have some minimum amount of energy that we require at every point in time. And then if we have some flexible loads that are, for example, loads that I can um, delay, as we have discussed uh, in the first part, or charging my electric car, I can charge it at a given rate. Um, the higher the better, but there is not a threshold effect like here, so we have a combination of those two. So that is what we uh, have on the consumer side. On the producer side, we have the dual of it. The simplest form is to assume that when a producer produces some quantity, Q, it does it at the cost C of Q. And the classical model is that the cost has increasing returns. I have a given capacity. If I'm close, getting closer to capacity, it becomes 
increasingly expensive to produce more, which gives, um, which gives uh, convex curves like x squared here. Um, this is typical of fuel-based systems that if you want uh, to generate more and more, then the efficiency of the system becomes less and less. So the cost here, which would be fuel, increases faster than the energy that you produce. You have other systems that have uh, only a fixed operating point. This is, for example, the case of a wind supplier. If we take as cost the running cost, the um, running expense is not the capital investment. Once you have installed your wind uh, farm, then the wind is free. So you have energy uh, at a given quantity. Now, this is a bit simplified. We know we can play a bit with the amount of energy, but if we simplify here, uh, it costs us nothing uh, to, uh, to produce it and to produce, to produce anything between zero and what and the max production that we can have is for free and producing more is impossible. So it has an infinite cost. So that is a very inflexible producer. And you may have flexible suppliers that have a maximum capacity. So they have a cost which is here shown linear, it could be also convex, and then there is a maximum capacity that you cannot uh, overcome. There are many other curves that depend on each technology. For example, as you may know, gas turbines have an operating point uh, which is optimal. If they operate at some point, then their cost is less. If they operate below or above, the cost is higher. So they're not uh, strictly increasing. But that's the view that people have when they design markets. They assume that producers react to something like this. Here. Then, to make the theory complete, the curve of interest is not the supply or the demand, it's not the utility or the production curve, but the derivatives of those curves that are called the demand and supply curves. So the demand curve is the derivative of the utility so implicitly we assume it, there is a derivative and it's uh, interpreted as the marginal utility. So if we take uh, this elastic load here, then its derivative, which is decreasing, will be something like this. And similarly, if I take a very simple and smooth producer that has a convex cost curve, then its supply curve will be something a bit similar, which is also increasing, perhaps not convex, but traditionally is assumed to be increasing. Those are the key curves that are called the demand curve and the supply curve. So they are the ones you will see everywhere when you read technical specifications of Swiss grid or of other kind of uh, contracts you may want to form to do demand response or to, en to enter, into a mar enter a market you will have to provide those curves here. And then a very simplified theory of economy says that in a perfect market where all actors are rational and nobody's cheating, so that's, as you can see, very far away from reality, then the market should settle at a point where the two curves intersect. So if I take the demand curve by summing up adding all the demands of all the users that are in the market. I add also the, all the suppliers. I do the aggregate curve and at the point where they intersect is where the market settles. This, the Q on the x-axis is the quantity that will be produced and bought and the P is the price here. Uh, why is that? Uh, where is why is that? Well, the explanation for that is given here. If I am a consumer, a rational consumer, I want to maximize my utility. So I have to go to the market and I don't know what exactly the price will be. For every price that there is, I will have a total benefit for me, which is the utility, U of Q, minus how much I pay. If the price is P, I pay PQ. So if I want to maximize my utility, I will agree for a point where the derivative is zero, if we believe that's a, a, a smooth uh, curve here. So the derivative of u, u prime of q, will be equal to p 
here. So the quantity that I will buy at this price is the quantity that makes me uh, as happy as possible. It's like when you go shopping somewhere, you buy, if you go to a very cheap place, you will buy lots of clothes because they are very, they are very cheap. Uh, but still, you will not buy an infinite number. If you go to a very expensive place, you will buy a few. So that's exactly what this thing is giving. And for the supply, it's the opposite. The supply wants to maximize its revenue, so it will sell as much as it can, but there is a cost of selling. And if you go beyond the point where there is a zero derivative, that would mean, typically, that you start losing money, that the benefit is decreasing, so there's no reason to sell more if selling more costs you more than selling less. So we see that the price will settle uh, when we have those two things equal. So u prime of q is equal to the price, c prime of q is equal to the price. In particular, the two are equal, and this is why uh, the market equilibrium is at the intersection. That's the theory. It's a very simple theory. If you talk to economists in the School of Management at EPFL, they spend their entire life doing research on seeing why this theory is not actually representing how things are in reality. Uh, but that's the theory that explains how the systems are designed. What could be the reasons for this theory for not being accurate? Can you imagine some? There could be imperfect market where here I'm assuming the price is given is something exogenous, so it's given by the market, and as an actor I don't control the price. So I just react to the price, which happens if we have what we call uh, price takers, which occurs when you have a large number of small uh, agents that are each unable to influence the market other than by saying I buy or I don't buy or I sell or I don't sell at this price. Of course, if you have one huge company that is deciding which has the capability to inject some cue or not, then a huge company can uh, manipulate uh, the supply curve, for example, by deciding to supply or not to supply. There's a historical example in the energy sector. That was the Enron company. In the, an energy company in California that had manipulated the supply curves in order to create blackouts by, on purpose, producing less than the market was asking for, which has had the prices going up. Of course, if you, uh, have, if you decrease the amount that is produced and the electricity sector is not a sector where you can very fast introduce more capacity, so if you are in a dominant position, uh, you're able to manipulate this. We've seen that in other domains, for example, in the, if the quantity here is not uh, energy but clothes, we see that companies like Amazon or Zalando are selling at a price which is below their, re their benefit. So they're not operating at this point, they're operating below in a certain segment of the market until all competition dies out. So they kill uh, competition by selling at prices below their operating expenses. And then once the competition is, uh, has disappeared, then they can raise the prices again. Nonetheless, this is what we are submitted to. And this is how uh, demand response is designed. Uh, for example, here, um, one of the papers we've seen last week was analyzing. So here it's showing the demand curve for light loads. So you see the demand curve is very rigid. It's not a straight line. It's decreasing, but it's almost vertical, which means there is a very, very small amount of flexible loads. And you see that the demand uh, can move from light load, of course, this curve is true at every point in time. For example, for a 15 minute interval during the day, that might be at the off-peak period, that's at the peak period. If the supply curve remains the same because we cannot adjust it, then we'll see that there will be a price difference. And now depending on how the demand curve uh, moves, we see here that a small 
change in the demand curve or a small change in the supply curve. In this example, this is how the supply curve has changed after an outage. It could also be after an Enron manipulation. And you see that if you're able to manipulate the curve such that the demand hits the, this high part here, then you're starting having very high prices. Why can we manipulate or wh why are the prices volatile in some sense? I mean, the a side effect of this economic theory, which is still close to how markets operate when there are free markets for energy. There is not free market for energy everywhere. In countries like Switzerland, it's a mixture of free market and regulation. Um, we see that a small change in something like the supply curve can have a dramatic impact on the price. Here we see a price that's multiplied by a factor of three here. Right? And uh, that can happen because the price is equal to the marginal cost of production, not to the average cost of production. Right? So that's the essential take-home message of this theory. Things settle at the marginal here, not at the average, the average which would be given by the integral. So if the price to produce the last 1% of energy is immensely high because we need to import from somewhere where they know we, uh, we must buy it, so they sell it at a very high price, uh, then that's the price of the market, even if the 99% of the rest is produced at very low price. This is uh, what this economic theory uh, gives. Of course, this is for one market. In electricity, there are multiple markets. There, are, there is the day-ahead market and the real-time market. So each of the markets is susceptible to this. And the price here might be the price of the real-time market that might be different from the price of the day-ahead market. Typically, day-ahead prices are much lower, but not always. Now, what this is showing is that if I have uh, if I have a flex, if I replace those inflexible loads by uh, flexible loads, so if, I, if I introduce some amount of demand response, of course, then we are more likely to not move to these very high prices here, because if the if the curve here is not very steep, then people will prefer not to consume at this time rather than buy at these tremendously high prices. So elastic loads may avoid price peaks. This is one of the, uh, of the messages that are used by the proponents of demand response by prices here. Let's check our understanding of this theory of uh, demand curve here. Let's assume through some demand response mechanism, I have the ability to disconnect some loads when the prices become too high. How would the demand curve look like in such a case? This might happen, for example, if you're a utility in a regulated market where you can, as a utility, you're in charge of buying the energy that you resell to your customers in a non-regulated, in a regulated uh, system. And to, in order to avoid the very high prices that you're submitted to, you may want to start demand response program, which means shut down some of the heating systems in winter or air conditioners in summer. So that's an exercise on how to read those curves. So this curve is the classic curve that is very smooth, so it's probably not the one we're interested in. Now, how do I read such a curve? I mean, for some reason, we plot Q and P. It seems to be a pattern in electricity. We always put uh, reactive power on the y-axis, active uh, on the uh, reactive on the x. So, normal in math, usually we would do the other way around. So, the the driving variable is this one. If I change the price, how does the quantity vary? So, we see here that if the price is increases. Uh, the quantity decreases, and then between P1 and P0, the quantity is completely insensitive. So that means whether the price, any of the price value here doesn't change uh, what you do, and then when you're above P0, you decrease. So this is uh, not expressing what we want. This is expressing uh, the opposite. Uh, customers that have an, perhaps an expectation that the price should be in this range, and when it is in this range, they think, they say, well, that's the expected thing. They, they stay where they are. 
If we do the same exercise here, we see as the price increases, so if we are here, we start there, so the quantity that we consume decreases, and suddenly when the price is reaches P0, there is a sudden drop here, a discontinuity, in the, which means that P0 is the level at which we, we reduce in a, the, the consumption, which means we shut down a number of appliances here. And then if the price is further goes down, we would continue decreasing. So that is uh, corresponding to the pattern of low disconnections at a given price threshold. So the correct answer is this one, number three. Which is one of the ways this paper that we saw last week was expressing what happens when they do demand response in this pilot study in Norway. Uh, this is exactly, so the, of course the elasticity is very small, so the, the curves are practically vertical, but there is this jump that expresses exactly that when they start switching off uh, appliances or when they signal a very high price at a period of time where people are expected to know prices might be high, then a large number of appliances will switch off, which gives the, uh, this, uh, this price here. And uh, they expect that this would have uh, the impact of in the area where they do demand response, uh, here is the price curve that you will get versus in the area we don't do uh, demand response here. I mentioned that the supply curve is, uh, the demand curve, uh, this, is, uh, this is not a supply curve, this is a, a demand uh, curve. The demand curve is something theoretical, but it, it's probably true for individual users. I mean, it's hard for us to quantify exactly what utility we attribute to being able to do something or not doing something. Uh, but for industrial customers, it certainly is something that is done. So industrial customers are able to say, um, are able to organize their production based on the prices of energy, and many of them do. And of course, shifting the production has a cost. So there is a, a price at which they are willing to do it and at which they're not willing to do it. So you can gather curves like this, which of course are not strict curves, they're more clouds of points. Uh, so this is uh, an example uh, of prices in, uh, in Georgia, uh, in the US, uh, saying uh, on the x-axis is the price here, on the y-axis is the quantity, so the converse of what I showed a minute ago, and this is in log scale here. So we see that it follows uh, a power law, in fact, which would correspond to this uh, uh, concave uh, type of curve I gave. Well, that's the end of the first part uh, of the theory, on the economic theory of demand response. Uh, now we do a little break, because this is the last, uh, last session of the, of the lecture. Some feedback on the evaluation, so there are the scores of the evaluation, which as you see are good. Uh, still, there were a few uh, comments that I'm displaying. One of them, there were not very many comments, there were four. Um, one of them is the contents of the labs. Um, so, uh, I don't know if this was generally shared. Any, anybody wants to speak about that? Or? Okay, of, of course we'll try to avoid that pattern as much as possible. Uh, there was another more interesting comment. Uh, I'll go straight to the point. I'm not here to do TCPRP. <laughs> and I don't know why we got a course on security. It's not even our job, right? Is it your job, right? Uh, so as you know, two weeks ago, there was this ransomware, WannaCry, that hit practically all kinds of utilities. So not surprisingly, some power utilities were hit. Of course, many power utilities that were hit will not make it public, but uh, some of them did. So there's one in India, and I'm sure there are plenty others. Um, so 
of course, this is not your job. I mean, trying to hammer against uh, this is not a course on, and this is not a, a program in IT security. And there are there is another program in IT security at EPFL, and you're not expected to become experts in IT security. But security awareness, and in general, I would claim information technology awareness is part of your job, right? You are we're in the 21st century. Uh, so it's part of the electrical engineer's job, just like it's part of the mechanical engineer's job, of the civil engineer's job. I mean, what are the jobs today? Well, what is, for example, I'm sure you know Marco Pignatti, is one of the TA, or was one of the TAs of this course. I mean, here's his PhD thesis. He's starting, he's working now in a startup company. What does the startup company do? They sell PMUs, right? So if you sell PMU, do you believe that you don't care about this, you don't care in security. Of course not. Of course, if you need a very sophisticated programming job, perhaps you will hire an IT expert for that. But for the standard kind of programming jobs, you will do it yourselves. And even if you don't do it yourself, you need to be aware of, um, of what it means to do it in a certain way, right? And if your 1,000 PMUs that you've sold to a large utility are subject to this, then you're in big, big pro trouble, right? So, uh, end of the preaching, I hope uh, many of you will be convinced that the technology we develop today uh, is, uh, is embedded in computers and we need to be aware of, uh, of, of how they work. Some philosophers of the beginning of the 20th century thought about that. There was the same problem 100 years ago when people were, because of the new technologies, uh, the new t what were the new technologies? There were steam engines for the trains, and then the cars, and then the radio. And then some philosophers, some philosophers started to think, I mean, should we leave the understanding of those machines to the experts in this field? And the answer that at least advanced philosophers said, say, of course you should leave the operation and the understanding of how to fix them, how to design them to the specialist, but you should have a mental model of how they work. When you drive a car, a car should not be an abstract thing that uh, does uh, things when you press a pedal or not. You should have a mental model of how a car works, that there is an engine, there are not little dwarfs that are pushing you or something, right? So you have a mental model. That's what we're doing here in this course. We're doing a mental model of security and of IT technology in general. So we go now into the, into the problem of knowing what happens if we do demand response. What happens to the, to, to the running uh, of the grid? So one way to capture this is to use what is called elasticity. Uh, where is the div? So when we do demand response, so in gray here, I'm showing as a function of time, a very highly stylized and simplified view of what the loads would be on a given grid. And if we want, for example, to do peak shaving here for whatever reason, so we change the, uh, the loads and we get the curve in red with demand response here. The hope is we will get something like this, but the question is, do we get this or do we get that? What's the difference here? Here there is what is called a rebound. We have uh, something more here. Should we expect this or that? What do you think? The first. The first. But you're not in Georgia where the weather is hot and humid in the summer and the utility has shut down your air conditioner for one hour, right? When this one hour period stops, what will you do, probably? You will push the air conditioning uh, at max because in the meantime, your house has become warmer and more humid and it's the evening and you want to go to bed and sleep well. So there is at least a question whether uh, there would be, I mean, the, the thing that you've reduced here, is it entirely recovered there? or does something of it uh, come here? That's, at least that's a legitimate question. And we, the truth is we don't really know. We, we don't have much experience on demand response programs other than very, very limited things uh, with inter interruptible supply. Uh, so what people have um, 
uh, I've tried to, to do is to at least measure things. Uh, and what we find, for example, this is uh, from a response program in, uh, in the US, I don't remember where, where uh, they did find that there was this rebound effect. So they were able to uh, attribute the load to air, pure air conditioning and other things. And so this is a program where the utility has direct access to the switch to which your air conditioner is uh, connected or to the control of your air conditioner itself that is deployed in uh, systems in the US. So they can really switch it off entirely and then they can uh, gradually uh, allow it to go up, uh, which will come this. And they usually see uh, this rebound effect uh, after, the, after the, the interruption, which is uh, not so surprising. The technical question is how we capture that in, in uh, quantitative terms if we want to do an MPC for controlling, for example, uh, a global system. So here, uh, the key concept is that of elasticity. Elasticity is defined as the derivative, so assuming that the quantity reacts to price, then the elasticity is defined as the, as usual, the inverse of the derivative of quantity to price in log scale. So it is derivative of log p divided by the derivative of log q, of the differential of log p divided by the differential of log q. So it's 1 over the derivative, uh, no, sorry, dq over q, uh, p over q, demand curve. This formula is correct, and I think this one is incorrect. So dq over q is derivative of log q divided by log p here. Should, into, should uh, switch p and q in this formula. So it's obtained from the demand curve. If we have the demand curve in natural scale, of course, we don't get that. If you write it in log scale, uh, that's, in fact, the derivative of the converse curve. So it's 1 over the, der the slope of the curve here. So this can be, at least in economical model that utilities gathers about their users, uh, they can get uh, those numbers here. Uh, in the worst case, if a demand is completely inflexible, then the elasticity is a zero, so the slope is infinite, and one over the slope is zero, uh, which corresponds to uh, a completely inelastic thing. When we do demand response, now we start shifting demand from one time slot to the next. So the key quantity that is sometimes used is called cross elasticity, which is the derivative of the demand at a time t plus h, where h is a time offset, divided by the derivative or the log derivative of the price at time t. h can be positive or negative. Now, capturing this is another story, but some people have tried at least to do what-if analysis and capture what happens if uh, there is uh, some assumptions we can make on cross-elasticity. For example, this paper here that we've seen also last week has given different models of the cross-elasticity coefficient here and they've essentially done two models. The first model, which they call, uh, the terminology is a bit uh, special, uh, they call inflexible. So an inflexible response to changes of prices consists in assuming that some fraction of the prices, a very small fraction, is delayed this corresponds here to the three hours. So here t is one hour. t equal one gives one hour. So when we do a demand response event, in the next, in the three hours that follow, there will be an increase of the demand. And somehow the users are expecting also that this thing might happen. So they also increase their demand before. So they are anticipating users. Nordic country type of people, they anticipate and plan. And during the demand response program, there, there is a 
an effect of 20% of the load reduction. So that is quantifying the how much reduction uh, we, we obtain here. Now, this is, I would say, the very uh, primitive form of demand response, which corresponds to, to this uh, experiment in Norway. I say primitive because it's not driven by a computer. You just know that from five to seven, there might be a very high price. So if you have to wash your uh, clothes today, then you will find a way to do it before or after. This is what this is expressing here. And here is assuming it goes uniformly in the three hours before or after. Now the optimizer model is assuming you have a better system, perhaps with a, a technology for uh, home automation, where you will have a computer or a device of some kind that is computing when to start the washing machine. So this is something that is more similar to what we're doing in the lab. It receives, in the lab we're doing for the heating, now you can do it for all the appliances. If you receive the prices and you have a forecast of the price, then you can decide when you will run your appliances. So of course you will not run it at the, high peer, at the periods of high prices and you will run it at other periods of time that may correspond at different prices. So that corresponds to a system that would run the MPC like we're doing in the lab here. And then in this paper, they have uh, simulated what happens with those two kinds of, uh, of, uh, uh, of demand response. So first, uh, this is showing the effects of demand. So the interest of demand response for these authors is to address what happens when we have contingencies on the generation side. We lose one generator or we lose one high voltage line, which has the same effect. Uh, then if we don't have demand responses, demand response program, then as we have seen before, the shift in uh, curve will force the prices to go up. So this is showing some, based on real data, uh, prices in a normal day on the real-time market and prices when there is a contingency here. And now if we do demand response, then with inflexible customers. So inflexible customers are those that know there will be this period of time to avoid and they shift the thing before or after. That gives the uh, yellow curve. And the, the initial price, that's the curve I've outlined in purple. That's the prices we would have. And if we have the yellow curve, then we see that in fact, it's true that when there is this peak here, we are responding to that, but there is a rebound effect uh, that causes uh, rebounds and rebounds of rebounds here. So it is, in fact, difficult to manage. This is a take home message of this paper. If you simply do demand response without having optimizing users, then it's hard to control what will happen exactly because of the rebound effect. So you have to be able to avoid the second peak here so in some sense, we see that there is a negative impact of demand response on the price, not on the price now, but on the price later. In contrast with optimizing uh, consumers that run the MPC, if their forecast of prices are fairly uh, good, then the system will adapt. And as we know from MPC, uh, we adapt uh, in a robust way. So even if things change, if the forecast changes, the MPC will change. And we do get something that is better when the prices are, are high here. So this was not assuming, uh, uh, this was assuming that the, uh, we could capture the elasticity and uh, which of course might or might not be true in reality. So take home message. Well, demand response, if you do it just naively, uh, not surprisingly, it might backfire. If you do it, you should do it the correct way, which means on the user side, you should do optimization like we do in the lab. What we did not do in the lab is do, the, because uh, the lab is long enough and you would complain even more, but the, uh, what you can easily imagine is that producers also must do the converse of what the consumer do. So when you start a demand response event, you decide today between five and seven, 
I will do demand response, you have to do that as the result of a global optimization that you have done with a model of the elasticity of your users to make sure that you will not have an even worse problem at 7 o'clock, for example. So you have to do it uh, concretely. There was a, a recent example in Spain where um, a lot of the production is coming from wind generation. And in some program, they started to do a demand response program from the peak hour, which is the end uh, of the afternoon, where they shifted some of this load to an off-peak period. But during the off-peak period, most of the production is based on wind generation, which is at a fixed and low price. But when you shift some of the load to that period, you have to increase the production during that period. Even if it's a low uh, production period, we are a bit like uh, this example here, where the prices were low, but we have shifted some of the loads. And by shifting some of the loads, we needed to start gas turbines at a period of time where normally the would, wind would have been enough. And the starting of the gas turbines was extremely expensive so that the, pr the overall balance was negative during the demand response program, was shifting loads for a high price period to a low price period that made the low price period become a very high price period. So those things happen. They happen if the producers or the utility or the TSO that's running the program is not doing a global optimization program like we do with MPC technology that we know well by now. Voilà. So that is the, the first take-home message on um, elasticity. The next topic we will see is beyond the rebound effect, what is called by some authors evaporation. So evaporation is, about, is not about the rebound effect. So the rebound effect is simply saying, if I delay a consumption or anticipate it, of course I will see earlier or later, I will see more. That's a rebound effect. Evaporation is about asking, it's the Voltalis question. If I do demand response on your boiler, will you, in aggregate, consume less? Right. So by delaying things, or by anticipating them, are we able to reduce, or possibly to increase, here? So the evaporation is, we can quantify it, is saying, if I look at two hypothetical scenarios, one without demand response, one with demand response, I take the total energy that is consumed in both cases, and I do the difference. What I had if I do not manipulate the market, and what I have if I manipulate it, so the delta uh, in relative terms here. So if there is pure demand shifting, if we just displace thing over time, the delta should be zero, at least approximately, evaporation should be zero. If by delaying things, we make them disappear, they evaporate, so people don't do it, you, you, you say them no, now then they don't do it later, then this, should be, this quantity should be positive, which means E1 is less than E0, so some we have saved energy, so evaporation should be positive. And the question is, what should we expect in general? We'll do a break and see uh, the answer to this suspense after the break. So we're ready to start our last session on evaporation. Let me start with a quiz. So assume after many years of hard work you've saved enough money to buy a chalet in the Swiss Alps or and the problem with the chalet is you still need to work in the winter, so you're not there most of the time. Should you uh, keep heating on when you are away or not? Right. So you come and during a weekend, for, you leave and come back to Lausanne. During the week, I mean, should you leave the heating on or not? Right. Assume you're interested in saving energy. Right. You heat with a heat pump, for example. So, should I interrupt heating when I'm away? Or, assume you do this, will this save energy? Well, they don't know, in fact, if you ask people. 
but there are pros and cons. I mean, you can say if I uh, if I shut down the heating, well, during the whole week I'm not heating, so I'm saving. But on the other hand, if I come back on the weekend, I'll have to heat much more. Perhaps if I want to find the chalet warm when I arrive on Friday night, I remotely start the heat pump on Friday morning, and then it will have to heat much more. So. Uh, but the majority of you says yes, and in fact, we will see the answer a bit later. Um, so the question is, in fact, the question of the chalet is really the question of evaporation. I mean, if I uh, stop the heating and I reinstall it later, am I assumed to save or not to save energy, right? So does shutting down the heating today imply, imply reducing total energy consumption compared to keeping the temperature constant, right? More or less constant if you have an MPC rather than a pure thermostat here. Now, uh, I stress again that this is not the same as the rebound effect. So certainly, shutting down the heating now will increase tomorrow's energy consumption. That is certain. I will need to heat it up again when I come back. But that's not the question. What we're interested in is the uh, integral of the thing. So to see the answer, uh, we will use a simple house model. In fact, the same we used last week, uh, the house model derived from Marquet, that is simplified, but as we can reason qualitatively, the main effect will, will be captured here. So remember, this model is saying that when I consume some heat, or some energy, it is multiply by a coefficient of efficiency, and then it's used to do two things. One is to heat the walls, essentially, that is captured by the inertia, and the other is to heat the canton, to uh, heat the air, uh, which is captured by the leakiness uh, coefficient. Right. We can interpret this as an equation of a leaky bucket. A leaky bucket is a bucket that is full of liquid, red, it's wine, probably here. Uh, you put some liquid into it, and uh, it leaks here. If you do the equation of this, the rate at which you put things, give this here, u epsilon, that's the amount of liquid you put here. The, you can interpret the temperature at time t as the uh, level of how full the bucket is, and then how much you leak is perhaps not proportional, but is an increasing function of the difference between the temperature and theta of t, which is, corresponds to level zero here. And uh, so when you put some liquid into this, it's used for two things. First, to increase the level that is captured by, uh, by this uh, inertia term here. And it's also used to uh, feed the leak here. So the equations are the same. Uh, as that, and this uh, analogy can help us. Now I want to see what happens over an entire period of time, so I integrate from zero to tau, and if I integrate this from zero to tau, I will have the int on the left the integral of the energy produced, on the right hand side I will have the integral of the temperature difference inside and outside, and on the left hand, on the final term, the integral of all this means gives simply the beginning, the end minus the beginning. So it's the temperature at the end of the period minus the initial temperature. Right. Now, we're equipped with this model. We can compare the two cases, the two scenarios. One, with you are uh, very pessimistic or optimistic, depending. So you heat your chalet the whole week, even when you're away, or you're lazy, you don't know where the off button is, so you, you continue uh, heating it, versus you do some interruption, but the interruption is such that at the end you will still, uh, you will still have the same final temperature, because you want it to be uh, warm again when you come back here. Right? So, if I do the integral of this, I obtain this quantity here, which is exactly the formula we saw last slide. Now, if I compare what happens when I interrupt, when I interrupt, the temperature at time t will be less than or equal to the temperature which I have when I keep uh, the temperature constant. We're assuming we're doing that in winter. So, if I stop heating, the temperature will start dropping. 
We saw that in the simulation of the MPC last week when we start injecting uh, energy into the building, then it starts decaying exponentially. So we should have this, that is true at every time. Now, because the, if I replace the case with interruption, the thing will change, I will replace the T star by T, but since T is less than T star, this total integral here, which is affected by positive coefficient, will be less. So the integral of this will be less here. The final temperature I will have will be less or the same. Now it depends if I manage to reheat the chalet just before coming, so they will be the same. So those two elements will be the same. But this integral will be less here. So that the total energy that is put with interruption will be less here. Which can be interpreted by this uh, so this is the scenario on the left, when we keep the temperature constant versus when we drop, we let the temperature drop. Of course, we need more energy here than here, but if we think of it as a leaky bucket, I mean, all the, all the energy we've put here is visible here and would have been put there anyhow. But the difference is that the leakage is not the same in both scenarios. If you keep your temperature high, the leakage is higher. The leakage is monotonic with temperature. If you have a higher temperature, you lose more heat than if you have a lower temperature. So that's the main argument, so that even if you take a more sophisticated model that captures the irradiation and other things, the, uh, the, the conclusion will be the same. By letting the temperature drop, you affect the leakage. Now the inertia uh, will be the same. The coefficient of inertia is not affected or only extremely marginally by the temperature. So the, the added heat you put here to heat the walls is heat you had put already in the system to heat the walls, but you will have less leakage. So conclusion, uh, it costs more, more heat at least, to keep the chalet warm without interruption. Therefore, there is evaporation. In, in this scenario here. Right. Now, I, I say here it costs more heat. Now, whether it costs more electricity is a slightly different question. Why is it a slightly different question? Because the heating system may have an efficiency that is higher. I don't know, maybe not. Because even if it has losses, it's always thermal losses, so it heats anyway. But it could have a different Exactly. It depends on the heating system technology. If you have resistive heating, which is not a very good idea because it's extremely inefficient, then this is not true. I mean, there's, for resistive heating, heat is exactly proportional to electrical energy. Right? It's in fact all the heat, all the electricity you put into the into the system becomes heat. So the, the efficiency is 100%, and there there's no problem. If you if you if you're using a more sophisticated system like a heat pump, for example, then the coefficient of efficiency of a heat pump is not constant, and depends on many things. It, it depends on the temperature of the fluid, air of water that you're using to transfer the heat. It depends also on the rate of heat that you want to produce. If you want to produce very high temperature water, the coefficient of uh, efficiency is less than if you want to heat by just a few degrees. If you do it at night when the outside air is very cold and you have an air heat pump, then the coefficient of efficiency will be much less than if you do it during, at midday when the outside air is warmer, for example. So there might be all those effects that may change from heat to energy and in particular, if you have a heat pump, you may be more cautious of, of this. But at least in terms of heat put into the system, it does help to let the system uh, go down. So now, this efficiency of some demand response program has been officially evaluated by uh, some agencies in some countries, for example, in France, by the ADEM, which is the French agency for energy efficiency and mobility, probably. And uh, they've evaluated uh, the Voltalis program and they, in a report that I cite here, and they, they found that it's true. Uh, you save 10% on heating if you, uh, 
if you uh, adhere to the, if you participate in the Voltalis program, which Voltalis is saying in a slightly unethical way, they say we come and put this uh, switching device in your electrical panel, we give you no money, we make money out of the reduction that you accept, uh, but you gain because your own uh, consumption will be reduced. And they found indeed, after removing of statistics, after doing some statistical processing, that there is a, truly a 10% reduction on heating, but not on hot water, hot water on boilers. Right. How do you interpret this? You, the experts in uh, green energy. And the majority says B. Well, the truth is we don't know. We, we should need perhaps to, to do further evaluation. But at least as a hypothesis, uh, it makes sense to assume B. Um, the evaporation. So all that, first we have to know that Voltalis is applying this to resistive heatings only, not to heat pumps that are um, resistive heatings in France are largely deployed. Uh, that's a symptom of the nuclear uh, uh, energy uh, majority in the supply. So for resistive heating, heat is proportional to energy consumption. That's the first observation. Uh, sorry, uh, we'll com come back to that later. And uh, we can interpret the fact that we save 10% by the fact that, in fact, we drop the temperature of the house by a fraction of a degree. By when when uh, Voltalis sends an interruption for one hour, you stop heating for one hour, uh, the temperature of the house will slightly decrease. We've seen that in the MPC model of David McKay's house, which is a moderately well-insulated house. That's the kind of insulation level you can obtain if you insulate an existing house. You don't build a new house. If you have a newer house, it will, the insulation will be much better. But even in an in insulated house, if you use existing buildings, after one hour, you will see a small difference. Right? Since the difference is small, uh, then simply you have a partly colder house, and this is the same effect as the chalet we have seen before. The energy you put again to warm up the house is less than the integral of the energy you would have put to keep the temperature the same during the, the whole temperature. So uh, the house leakage is explaining this 10% loss and also a drop in temperature. Of course, where Voltalis is cheating is that you could simply receive a message that says, reduce your temperature by half a degree during one hour. It would have uh, the same effect, but you would, Voltalis would not be able to pay it, right? You would save, you can save energy yourself by reducing the temperature by half a degree. For the kind of house models that we have in David McKay's, you can see in David McKay's book, there are more data, uh, but dropping the temperature by a degree has a significant impact on on the consumption. I don't remember exactly the figure, but it's significant. It's uh, perhaps 10%. So that could uh, explain this here. Now, boilers are typically when insulated and well confined systems. So if you boil the hot water from three to four or from five to six, it probably does not have a visible effect. This probably is uh, some effect because if you boil it five hours before using it, probably there is some loss but it must be very small, such that in the statistical noise it can be, cannot be um, uh, strictly uh, put forward. Right. Voilà, so that's the, the main conclusion uh, from this. Now I want to put a, a caveat on, on, on those conclusions. So we have seen that for such resistive systems there is an evaporation, and so this is a bit contradicting the statement I did at the beginning where I said the goal of demand response is not to save energy, but is to better manage the production and the grid. Uh, here, well, we see there might still be a side effect on energy consumption. And as, as we discussed before, if you have a non-linear system like a heat pump, then we need to be more careful as this, uh, things might be complicated. Um, in the future, the problem 
in the future, the grades will be compared to today. So the grades you will have to work with in your career will be impacted at least in cold countries like here, even though today it's not cold, but the uh, yearly average is uh, cold. Um, there will be a large penetration of heat pumps. So the nonlinearities of them uh, will have to be modeled. And hopefully also there will be a large penetration of electric vehicles. So those two aspects are changing the, uh, the nature of the electric grid. For electric vehicle, you have a similar, similar effect. It's not very visible today because electric vehicles are marginal loads that have no impact on the global management of electricity consumption at the scale of a, of a country. But if we have 10, 20% uh, deployment of electric cars, uh, we expect that this will have a visible impact on the grid. I mean, depending on the numbers, uh, if we would replace all mobility, which is powered by fuel today, by electricity, that would have an increase on the electricity consumption of a country of the order. Now, the estimations vary. Some say 100%, some others say between 50 and 100%. But certainly, it will have a dramatic impact on the consumption of electricity in any country, right? Even if we take the lower figures of with 30% penetration, we would have an increase of 20, let's say 20%. I mean, managing an increase of consumption of 20% is a major, uh, a major issue for, for many grids. It's an issue for the production side. It's also a major issue for the distribution grids because those increases will show up in the distribution grids. Normally, increase in consumption comes by growth of the population. So you have more people, you have more houses. If you have more houses, you build new extensions of the grids here. Now here we're talking of something else. We're talking of a penetration that is due not to more grids, but people who live there all of a sudden connect their car to the grid. So the grid itself will not expand by becoming bigger. It's the same grid on which we'll have to manage this. So certainly people will do uh, the same thing we did for the house. We will need to manage, and this is one of the papers we've mentioned last week, we'll need to manage the charging of the electric cars. So that's very similar in terms of MPC as you had to do your car. And here, uh, there is a similar evaporation effect. Uh, if you charge at very high intensity, so if, if, you if I have a car and I want to charge it, and if I don't have to pay and I don't care about the grid, I will use the fastest charging possible. If I have a supercharger that can charge it in th 45 minutes, I'm happy. If the charging takes six hours, I'm less happy, even if I don't need it now, but I know during six hours my car is uh, not available, so if I buy a car, it's to be free and mobile, so I want to charge it as fast as possible. Unfortunately, high intensity charging has high losses also, losses in the inverters, uh, perhaps even losses in the lines in extreme cases, but also losses in the battery. The battery has some resistance. If you charge it at very high currents, uh, there are losses that are not negligible, so you can um, uh, increase uh, the, the losses by 10-20% by charging at high uh, currents. Uh, so we have, we'll have similar effects. If we start doing demand response, uh, then we will have here uh, something that may have positive evaporation in the sense that if we force cars to be charged slowly, then we'll use less energy. But if we force a car to be charged later, that might be at a higher current, that may have a positive uh, evaporation. So take home message, when we will need to do an MPC type of optimization exercise like we do for the house, we will need to incorporate uh, this evaporation or cross elasticity effect for uh, cars as well. Voila, uh, here are some of the references. So conclusions. Um, Demand response, which is just starting now, uh, can be seen as a form of virtual electricity storage and will be competing with the various forms of storage. Now, physically, it is not storage, so it is much, much cheaper in terms of physics. More complicated to use because you have users in the loop. And uh, as we have seen, it can act at 
the time scale of energy competing with the other forms of energy markets and also at the ch time scale of what we call power for real-time demand response uh, for some of those schemes. Well, and that's the end of this module and of this uh, lecture and of this course for the lecture part. Uh, are there, do you have any questions? No, then if you don't have questions uh, now, perhaps you'll have later that you may ask on, uh, to us directly on or on the Moodle uh, news group. The continuation today is the lab. So we will uh, stay in the room for you to continue the lab. And we meet again on Friday for, uh, for a quiz and I believe in early July for the exam.